We've been teaching on reigning in life in Christ. Amen. You said if I want it to turn back right, I have to hold it up like that. Oh, it did really great. I'm learning about tablets, you know. I do have a phone and a few things, so. But this is an old tablet, black and white. Amen. All right. Amen. So the series is called Reigning in Life in Christ, but if you're taking subnotes, it's ambassadors of the kingdom. Being a true ambassador of the kingdom. Now, in my recollection, and what I know to be an ambassador, is somebody that represents either a nation or a king or a kingdom and is ordained by that kingdom and, or by that king to represent them. Can you say amen? Now, I think Christians, all of us as believers, should take that a little bit more seriously about how we represent Jesus Christ. Do you believe me? Now, God's, I'm going to have to tell you a little story about me. I, when I first got saved, I saw God do some miraculous things. I saw a guy walk off the stage at a Brother Shambach meeting and never touch the ground for about three seconds. And then just went, boop. And everybody, 10,000 people saw it. I saw miracles, people get out of wheelchairs, and I thought, I want that. I want that in my life. And we should really want that. Can you say amen? I want that kingdom rule, what I see with my eyes. And, you know, I've been to many, many different tent revivals, helped a few people set up some tents, helped Brother Shambach. If you don't know who R.W. is, Shambach, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. Even if you remember the way he used to come on on the radio. Anyway, I set up his chairs and done his ushers for several years down at the, at the fairgrounds. But he's not traveling. He's retired. I don't know if he's still with us, but he might have gone on with God. But he started a marvelous church and is still going today. But you know what? We need to be raised and exposed to the miracle-working Jesus Christ. That our faith not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. I didn't come to you with excellence of speech. I didn't come to you with degrees and call me Dr. Fahrenheit. I came to you with a pure heart, broken and ripped up, Paul says, but I came to you with demonstration and power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be preaching. That's what we need to be living around. This ministry here, God gave me the vision for this ministry when I fell asleep when we had our grandson, and I'm sleeping in the visitor room, and God says, I want you to name this end time ministry that I have for you, CCM, Christ-centered ministry. And for the reason that Jesus is our focus. Can you say amen? Now, we know there's a Father, and the Father wants us to lift Jesus up. And we know there's a Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit keeps pointing us to Christ. So let me tell you that Jesus Christ is what we need to focus on and behold, and to get to pursue more. Why? Because he takes us before the Father. He helps us. He releases the Holy Spirit. Now, here's something about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so gentle and so pure, he will resist any pride. Everyone say, no pride. Well, let me tell you why. Satan fell from heaven because of his pride. And God hates pride because pride keeps us away from God. Pride divides people. Pride is the one who says, I'm better than you. You're better than me. And human pride comes only from the flesh, not from your spirit. Because you and I, born again believers, we have God in our spirit, man. So in our spirit, man, God cannot sin. And here's where a lot of Christians fail. Please don't get mad at me. They're walking for God. In the natural, noble and wonderful. But see, what they forgot is the engine to the power. We don't walk just for God in the natural. We walk by the help of God in the spirit. And in order to do that, we have to be with the God so that we can get used to having him project us. Now, do you remember in the scripture, says it through the gospels, where Jesus was moved with compassion? Do you remember that? And I went to God. Uh, this is about six months ago. And I said, Lord, tell me more about that. And he says, son, compassion there is my love in motion. 
And he says, when my love in motion reaches out towards someone, the power of God is present. Teach my people to walk when they get up, present themselves to me, and to walk projecting love in just out in front of them so whatever comes into their action, a business situation, maybe a traffic situation, maybe a child or something comes into your space, you project love first and react later. Everyone say amen. For Jesus was moved with I know, know this principle. No one received anything from Jesus first till they came to him. And the reason why many people don't receive much is they don't come to God like they think they're coming to God. And they're not being, now please don't get mad at me. They're not getting dirty, gritty, nitty, goo God up with God to the point they disappear and they just become. They don't stay consistent enough. So what happens, we fight this battle of self. And let me talk to you about it. Remember, we're growing up from the inside out. So there are blockages that Satan has put in us, that bad things that we've learned in our past that somehow pop up once in a while and seem to lock us into some kind of bondage. How about stubbornness? Look at your neighbor and say, stubbornness? It's wonderful to be stubborn for God, but it's awful if God's trying to tell you he wants you to stop doing this and you're stubborn and you're not going to. That's how you keep yourself from healing. Find out. Say, God, present yourself. Is there some stubbornness in me that I can't see? You, we need to learn to pray that way because his eyes are, are far beautiful and more focused than ours. And you know, if we focus too much on ourselves, we're going to get blind anyway. What do you mean? We're not to focus on ourselves, are we? So if you're trying to believe and you're trying to do that, where is our focus? Actually, this, the serpent just laughs. <laughs> the dummies, they don't know. They're focusing on their self. And so I'm not trying to make us feel bad. I'm trying to open our eyes to the revelations of what the Spirit wants to teach us. Are you ready to get in this? All right, praise God. Our ambassadors of the kingdom. All right. So let's turn and read our scripture. Kind of nod at me if it's up. All right, you guys are wonderful. Amen. Bless you guys. Thank you for our sound people. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. Listen to what it says. Where is the wise? How many years know, know it's not in the world very much? Where is the scribe? Do you know what a scribe is? A, a minister, a ministrative secretary. They, they write things down. Okay, you got the idea, and plus much more. Where is the disputer of the age? That's Satan, by the way. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Everyone say amen. For since the wisdom of God, the world through their wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. The message preached to save those who believe. Now, folks, that is a sifting unit. The only people that will accept Christ are the ones that believe they can't no longer go forth on their own. They fail, they fail, they fail. And then we come to the end of ourselves, and then we say, oh, God, please come in tomorrow. Help me with this. Can you say amen? Now, God takes that very seriously because he does, doesn't he? When you ask him, doesn't he come? Yes. Now, let's go on. This more beautiful. Let's look at this. For the message that is preached to save those who would, who would believe. Now, remember I told you all you have a little thing in your heart. Every human being does. It's a believer thing. It's a little unit in your, in your spirit, man. Before you're saved, believes in things. Just believes. You look a little child, if you've had a child. And the little child just wants to believe, and mom and dad just wants to believe in everything it's told, because they're designed to be that. We weren't designed to be under a curse of sin. So the child just has a believer in it. So Satan plays games with it and begins to work at an early age on people and begin to guide them away somewhere so they won't hear about God. That's where you come in. You're going to share Jesus with everybody. And stop being so divided and picking on everybody's faults. Listen, I have plenty of faults. If you're going to spend time looking at me, then you're going to be hopelessly lost. (laughs) 
Look at Jesus. Can you say amen? He'll straighten me out. All right, we, come on, you're with me. All right, so what do we do? For, for, for to the Jews, Jews look up, God show us a sign, request a sign. And the Greeks, those intellectuals, seek after, we need your knowledge and wisdom because then we're going to be godlike. That was the philosophies of the day, see, and I'm going to share it with you. And it says, but we preach Christ. Can you say amen? Christ crucified. He died, rose again. To the Jews, it becomes a stumbling block. To the Greeks, ah, this is foolishness. How can someone die and rise again? 24, but to those who are called both Jews, both Greeks, Christ, the power of God. See, we need to center in on him and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. You see, back in that day, they believed in the, the Jewish church preaching, preaching. Now, if you ever talk to a Jewish rabbi or a church person, they're wonderful. They're so stuck in their ways, they're stubborn and miss God. They'll argue about everything. And even when they know they're wrong, they won't say they're wrong. You know, and Jesus called them stiff neck. Now, I'm not picking on Jewish people. I love them. I bless them every morning. And from my whole heart, I've been to Israel. I love Israel. Walk through the streets, been to places you can't go anymore. Like in, on the Dome of the Rock, I got on the platform, walked around, got into the Dome of the Rock, and saw the blasphemy words. You think the Antichrist needs the Jews to build another temple? No, he already got an Antichrist temple right on the Temple of the Mount. Think about that. I believe the Antichrist will be Islamic because they denied Jesus Christ. So don't get mad at me or, or write anything. I'm not against them. I just want them to know Jesus. Can you say amen? All right. Another thing is, you heard yesterday, our, our president, somebody tried to take his life. And um, that's going to open up a lot of things. So please pray for the government. Please pray for uh, President Trump and his family. Okay? Please pray for this election. You hope you're doing all that. Don't get into, listen, don't get into discussions. Two things you don't do with your family, religion and politics. Remember, I'm not a religious man, and neither are you if you believe in Jesus. You have a relationship with Jesus. But you don't bring up debate. You don't debate. Debating will actually draw the enemy to you. Hello? God doesn't need you to debate him. He needs you to preach him. And whether they believe it or not, I give you the word of God. I'm not here to convince you to be this way. If you don't, you're gonna, we're all going to miss something. I don't want you to miss anything. Can you say amen? Let's go to our last scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, listen to this. Verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him. So we should talk like him. We should walk like him. We should have the power that he has. And there's only one reason. Jesus said it this way. Because I go to be with the Father. And because I go to be with the Father. The works that I do. Shall you do also. And even greater works than these. Shall you do. Why? Because the Holy Spirit now placed Jesus in our heart. He's all around us. And not only that. Here's what I taught a while ago. Let's see if you remember this. What was the one thing we have that Jesus didn't have when he, here, he was here on the earth? Jesus. You see, we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Jesus only had the Father and worked by the, a limited amount of the Holy Spirit because he was so in tune with God. Hello. But we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have the new covenant, the blood, the angels, and yet we're sitting around playing Mamby Pamby Church. I, I told somebody the other day, I said, look, I've been highly trained against witchcraft. I've taken people in law enforcement, and we have literally destroyed witches' covens in Wilkeson and Carbonado. Chief of police, both in Algona Pacific, were my best friends, and they were my ushers. You see, so I was highly trained in a lot of this stuff, and I want to pass some of this out to you. 
And there's a way in which you can really, really discern what is not of God and what is of God. And I know you can do that naturally, but spiritually as well. If you walk into a situation, you should be able to pick up what controlling spirits of the enemy that are there, be able to arrest them, bind them up, and remove them out of the area. Hello? God wants you to be able to do that because you're preachers of the kingdom. You're ambassadors. That means you speak for, you walk on behalf, and you represent. So listen, stop talking so much. Stop babbling boo-boo stuff. Get yourself in line. So back to the story with me. So I went to God and I said, God, what can I do to have what I see, the power and the demonstration that you say in your word and that I see my pastor operating in. He says, first of all, number one, you have to present yourself to me daily so I can cleanse and check anything that will get in the way throughout the day. Two, you have to get a check on your mouth. Your mouth is the cause of most of our problems, he said, most of your problems. Watch what you say. Make sure there's no unbelief. In it. Now, you can't be legalistic. But you need to clean it up. Okay? Listen, so watch what comes out of your mouth. Don't say religiously, flip out things, because sometimes those are wrong. And if you're around somebody like me, I'll correct you. So are you telling me this? Well, no, no, I didn't mean that. Well, stop flipping words like that. Pay attention. Jesus said, every idle word that man shall speak. I got our little written down thing. We're going to talk and we're going to get together about it. Whoa, cleanse me and let me have crop failures. Now, look, at, remember something. Pastor Carol will look at everybody. So if I'm looking at you and I'm proving a point, it doesn't mean you're guilty. And a lot of times I told some friends, I says, if I mention your name in a service, that means I love and feel close to you. And when Jesus did that, he loved and felt close to him. For example, Philip, have I been such a long time with you, you see? Peter, do you really love me? You see, and we kind of get this religious idea. You mentioned my name. Hey, you're famous now. Get the tape. And so I'm going to emphasize that for a while because people are so, uh, and they never get anything out of church. Amen. Are you ready? Let's get into this. All right. So we're going to go ahead and, and read the four things that we're going to go ahead and cover. We're going to cover these four things, and then I'll go ahead and give you a couple of notes. Today, we'll cover these four areas. You taking notes? The humble and the surrendered life. Here's a thing that's very hard for Christians to do. Number one, to stay humble and to have a surrendered life. And yet, we sing about it. We talk about it. So the only way, now listen, the only way that any one of us can do that is by presenting ourselves to God and have God help us to stay humble. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. So if I humble myself under God's mighty hand, I surrender anything that might not be of God. Every day as he cleans me up, maybe pride or whatever, he then it makes me presentable. I become presentable as a representative of him. And what does he do? Now listen carefully. He promotes you. He says, I can trust in Scott because he seeks me. He diligently tries to do what I've asked him to do, and he's progressively consistent. In other words, he doesn't stop, start, stop, 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 stop. He goes right on through. Now, I'm just describing a picture. And because of that, I will reward him openly. Blessed are those that believe in God, who come to God, believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them. Yeah, diligent means consistently. It doesn't mean... Oh, throw everything down. And, no, it means go after God first and consistently stay after it, whether you see anything or not, because last week we learned about the seed. Some of you got seeds pending in the earth, and they're wanting to grow, but you're running around saying, I don't see anything. Don't say it. You might think it, but please don't say it. And we learned about that last week. Go back and listen to that, okay? So we, we're to humble and be surrendered what that life is like to we who control our tongue enjoy a full and blessed life. I said we because I want all of us included. Say amen. Not like I am and you're not. Thirdly, how we re represent Christ 
can be either bitter and religious with an attitude, or it can be sweet. Say amen. I'm referenced to the two fountains that you and I have. We have a bitter fountain and we have a sweet fountain. Now listen, your bitter fountain is your flesh. That's why God wants you to crucify it every day with him so that your bitterness doesn't spew forth. Yeah, I hate that. The government's just a lousy bunch of junk. Blah, 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 blah. Bitterness. Bitterness. Shut that off. Whether you know it or not, that is poisoning you. Say, oh, okay, you love me. But you see, you can hear what I say, but will you retain what is said? And then finally, thirdly, how we represent Christ, bittersweet. And then fourthly, the work that I do shall you do also, Jesus said. Hello? So there's a specific way in which Jesus did the will of his Father, the work of the Lord. I'm going to share a little bit of that today. I let it leak out a little bit about having love, moved with love. You see, if I'm going to say something, maybe somebody insults you, and, and you want to just let them have it, step back for a second and let love come forth. It might be real tough, but it says to love your enemies, Dis those that despise you, speak evil of you, love them anyway, because God has a little surprise for them. You, God can figure that part out. Hello? You see, when we get all tangled and try to justify ourselves and you fight and wrangle and stuff, Satan just sits back and he laughs and laughs and laughs. Look at the bimbos. Come on, you can laugh with me because I used to be one. I get all upset. I don't know. I'm just that really upset me. I said, I tell you, that's a bimbo. Don't be that way, everyone. And you know, I'm trying to throw harmless names out into the air. All right, you ready to get in this? Yeah. All right, so basically, we're to grow and to be downloading the Word of God on a daily basis. Now, I know many of you read your Bible, but don't read it from the intellect. Take a little minute to pray, and then ask God to put it right into your spirit man. Now, think about this. Who lives in our spirit man? Jesus does. Remember, we'll focus on Jesus. Well, of course, God. But that's too general for some people. They need the Jesus focal point. Jesus does. And he's at work in you, isn't he? Now, let me ask you something. Now, this is, again, for those coming in and watching. Does Jesus know everything? So, you're really not teaching your spirit man with Jesus in it anything. But what's happening, whenever we receive the word after a little prayer, things will come alive, and it's downloading into your spirit, and Jesus is uploading it into your understanding. The eyes of your understanding becoming enlightened. You don't get it in the head first. I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Well, shut your head down, open your childlike baby heart, and get the pablum of the word. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Intellectually, many people don't get a thing out of it because immediately they pick, they sit in church, pick faults. They judge, pick faults, they do this, get into discussions, and then when they come where the word's being laid out, Satan just sit back and laugh. Look at the boo-boos. Look at the boo-boos. We're not boo-boos. You better be smart. God needs new leaders in this age we live. I am here to raise up new leaders. We need the youth, the young in here, learning how to appropriate and become ambassadors for Christ. Can somebody say amen? Take this thing seriously. We're almost out of here. Remember the Holy Spirit came and brought with him the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom came with power and authority, and we have all these gifts. So let's go to point one. The humble and the surrendered life. See, that's me. Now, by, now, you might not feel humble at times, and you might not feel like you're surrendered. But feelings, this is a statement of faith. Father, help me to be humble. Help me to be surrendered. And Lord, if there's some area that I need work, then work on me. You see, we forget the interaction with God. That's where a lot of Christians keep on bumbling around. Interaction with God. Lord, it says right here in James, let's read along. 
but he gives more grace. Do you need more grace? Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. Your flesh, he does not like. Everyone say, God does not like my flesh because it has pride in it. And I want to tell you why. Because sin is the nature of Satan, and Satan has pride. That's why when we do things ourselves, we do it to be somebody, or to do it to impress something, or to make ourselves happy. If I get a new husband, maybe my life will be all better. No? Pride. And God resists the proud and gives grace to the how to be humble and surrendered. So you start up your day, Father. Help me surrender to you and be humble today. And Lord, you have my future. You have all of my clients, all my business, have all of that. It doesn't do me any good to worry about it and especially talk about it. So Lord, I humble myself and I surrender everything to you. If it fails, then it's a failure that you have because I put it in your hands. Hello? Did you catch that? Okay. Because we have to keep it up in God's hands. But Satan uses everything he can to choke the word. Remember, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things, enter in and choke the word, and they become unfruitful. Parable of the sower. Now, let's go on and get more into this. As God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Now you know why no man in the flesh can please God because it projects a pride. So we take ourselves, Lord, I humble myself, crucify my flesh in Jesus' name. I bow before you. You can do it in a chair. You can do it in bed before you get your feet out and have him just saturate it. You'll sense, once you do this consistently, you'll sense like he put dental floss and it goes... <laughs> And you feel clean every time you do it. But it'll take some consistency to break loose into that. I mean, we want it now. Look, at God wants to see you're faithful. He says, hey, you know, people come in, and I'll please them. Everybody gets mad at me. Listen, don't be one of those show up when you want and show up when you don't. You know, high steeple, few people, you know, the, all, all this kind of weird stuff. Remember... The man who plays the best gambling games is in this earth playing everyone as best as he can to keep you distracted, too busy, and not mature in God. Moving right along. Therefore, submit to God, verse 7, resist the devil. First, you've got to submit to God. Then when you resist him, all you do is stand. You don't rail on him. You don't call him boogerhead. You know, you, come on, resist the devil, and he will what? Just turn your back and walk off. Oh, it's just you. See, it's attitude, what you're exposed to. I, I'm amazed at how many Christians tell me how spiritually they are, and then they fall all apart. Don't d tell everybody that you're this. Let God promote you. When God pushes you forward, he's supporting you. He's backing you. Say amen. So as you humble yourself, listen, as you humble yourself before God, he promotes you. He lifts you up. Hello? The more we fight and struggle, the more it seems like pride's there, and it just seems like everything just is, is put on pause. No, no, no. Point one. Church, we as believers have a body of flesh. It has the nature of sin in it, which, of course, is Satan's nature, and it desires worldly things. You got to kill it. Because like blackberries, they can get out of control. Two, the nature is the nature of the evil one, point two. So we are to bring ourselves wholly before God. Amen. Amen. To have a sincere face-to-face -face with God. To bring our body before God daily so he can keep killing it. Hello? You didn't learn all those bad habits overnight. 
you got to keep coming to God and letting him kick back those things that you used to do or those little phrases you used to say, like you know when you don't. I know, I know, you know. Come on now, I'm kind of funning with you. All of us, point three, all of us as believers, there's a tendency to be prideful. In fact, have we talked about the wonderful things that God, Paul warns us, to be not conceited, but always be humble, treating others better than ourselves. Say amen. Fourthly, let me encourage each of us to stay our course and get out of the flesh as often as you can. And the only one that can help you to do that is God, to lift you up out of that old, angry person or whatever you, we used to be. And then fifthly, the humble and the surrendered believer waits upon the Lord and his instructions. Before making any major decision, prays about them. Lives a surrendered life. And as he waits on the Lord, he serves God's people. Or she serves God's people. Jesus said, if you've done it unto the least of mine, you've done it unto me. So therefore, I always smile at somebody when they treat me rude or anything. And I go, you're in trouble. <laughs> Don't. Try your best. Remember, love is before you. Jesus never was rude. Now listen to anyone except for those who were religious and rude to him. Remember, they wanted to kill him. And they said, trying to justify themselves. And Jesus looked at him. He says, look, you run around and you strain at everybody's little faults like gnats. But you open your big fat mouth and you swallow elephants. That's what Jesus said. I kind of amplified it a little. Are you with me? So let's go into point two. We who control our tongue enjoy a full and fruitful life. Right? Now, it's not just the slip or two of the tongue, not just mistakes that we make. It's the habitual. Some people have cussed so long, even after they become Christians, if they're not careful, they don't continue to grow. That cussing will come back. It really doesn't come back. It was just pushed off to the side and not dealt with. Hello? That's why some people will follow after God, but later on, the devil will just back up, and their old habits and stuff will start coming up. They don't seek God. They're not praying. And pretty soon, all of that will choke the word. And the enemy will say, oh, good, I got another one. Hell lost another one, because I am saved. I am saved. Hell lost another one, because I am saved. You are saved. You see, but the enemy still doesn't want to let us go. So be smart, folks. If you're, if you're in a war and you, it wasn't your fault, but you were thrown into a war, then be cautious. Be wise. Amen? You are in a war, and Satan is losing even though it doesn't look like it. God needs all of his children to focus in, get in the ark, Get in his realm of the kingdom so that he can shield us and get us ready to go home. Lord, there are a lot of goats out there. They're not following Jesus. They're trying to build their own kingdom. Now, I'm not attacking them. I'm just saying we need to pray for them so they get rid of that misguidedness. Listen, this isn't about me. This isn't about you. It's about winning the loss to the Lord, training them up and helping them become someone that works in God's fields and win souls. Can you say amen? All right. So we control our tongue. Look at James chapter 3. I love this. Verses 1 through 4. This is awesome. My brethren. Now remember, James is talking to Jewish people. Remember, Jewish people are really hard to teach. They're married to the law and a lot of their understanding. Now, I'm not putting them down. I'm trying to describe to you what a lot of the church doesn't. That means, that means they're a hard nut to crack. So, many of you become teachers, my brethren. Let not many of you become teachers. Hello? Knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, here you go. He is perfect or mature, a mature man, able to control or bridle the whole body. Wow. Now, do you believe the word? So if you got anything out of your control of your life, check your mouth. 
I mean, just check yourself. I'm not picking on you. Because you'll find out a lot of people, if you listen to their conversation, more than half of what they talk about is totally shouldn't. They just do because they've done it for so long. And we ought to think about that with ourselves because we want a stronger relationship. God told me, Carrie, if you want to move in power and want to speak in power, then you have to get your mouth under control. Hello, say amen. Now I'm talking about me. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a mature man able to bridle his whole body, control it. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. They're big. And they may obey us. And we turn their whole body. They, we turn their whole body. What problem do you have is our body. You want your body out of sorts? You overweight? You can turn your whole body by how you speak consistently. I'm going to just pause and toast that up. Man, can you feel the anointing on that? We have to take him at his word. We have to believe the word of God. Look also at the ships. Though they are so large and even driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot lifts or directs it. Here's your rudder. Now, folks, remember, you're a spirit person. You have a soul and you live in a body. You're a new creature with Jesus in it. You know, come on, say amen. That's us. Needs to have control of your tongue. Now, what happens is it pretty much does. I know a lot of you, your tongue's not really out of control. But you know you get yourself a little angry. And you get yourself a little huffy and stuff. And you, you see how quick the tongue can get out of there. I'm just talking about it. So if you have suffering with that too much, maybe you've got spiritual Tourette's, you can go before God and have him kick that back and adjust it. But I'm amazed at how many Christians don't go to God and say, clean me up and work on me. They think they already arrived. Now, probably not so, but they don't know to ask. You see, every day I ask God to make some kind of change in my heart. So it comes out and you can experience the fruit of it. Hello. If you've got a tree and it produces pretty good fruit, don't you dig around and don't you give it the vitamins and make it it so that the fruit is produced more? Hello? Ah. And when you're branches and you're producing fruit, what does Jesus say? I'm going to prune you. Wonderful. We should expect God to prune us because we know it's going to be good. See, the devil sold you on the lie. Well, God prunes you, he just throws you to the wolves and they just beat you up and then he pulls you out just in time to make you into somebody. You know, I used to hear that kind of preaching. You know, all I say is, no. Anyway, that's about all I want to say. Anyway, I'll look at verse 4. Look also at the ships. See what they're driven. Look at a couple of points on there. Here James clearly says that if we are going to be someone that teaches others, we're going to, the devil's going to put a little bullseye on us. Pray for us, lift us up, because we're influencing others. People who have money, have businesses, you influence others. Satan's got a bullseye on you, so don't you take your Christianity lightly. Your relationship with God should be solid as a rock. Say amen. Secondly, Jesus said that our words, by our words we are justified, by our words we are condemned. The positive thing about this is that we can change our words. We can ask God for a crop failure and neutralize all the bad stuff we've been talking Have you ever had a friend, and he seemed to follow you, or she followed you everywhere she go, you, you went, and if you went to visit friends, they always caused trouble? I did. He went, big faults, flirted with the ladies, and I've always had to pick him out of some pile of rubble and then whisk him off in the car. I mean, there was a friend like that. I only had him for a short six months as a friend. Well, you have a friend called your flesh. And if you don't deal with it on a daily basis, everywhere you go, it will stir up a little trouble. You might say the wrong thing. You might think the wrong thing, God forbid. Hello? 
Hello, is anybody, can you identify? So we have to do something with this entity. God is not taking this. If he's not taking it and not receiving from it, then we shouldn't carry it around a lot. So once you go to God and crucify it, God did not consider your flesh at all. He considers your spirit and your soul. And then you can feel towards the end of the day how your flesh is starting to gain its strength. And even though it's tired, it's gaining its control. And that's when you go to sleep at night and you lock the door and you say, Lord, I present myself to you so I may rest and enjoy your rest that you give me in sleep in Jesus' name. And it's something like that. Are you with me? James also, point three, goes on to say, we have two fountains, a sweet fountain and a bitter fountain. Where's our bitter fountain, folks? Flesh. Where's our sweet fountain? In, in our spirit where Jesus lives, the new creation. Might as well, everyone, I love the tummy. Because Jesus says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Huh? And he said to the woman at the well, you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. But you drink of the water I give you, you'll never thirst. For out of your belly shall flow well springs of water springing up. See, in your belly, not your head, not your flesh. You go to God and let God fill your belly. Can you say, if that's a funny way to say it, fill you up to the top. And when you feel started to get drained, stop, just five or two, two, five minutes, get filled up again. Don't be a dummy and get beat all up and go in the day and say, why, oh, why, oh, God? And he says, I didn't, I didn't, didn't. And fourthly, remember, Proverbs says that a fool is known by the multitude of his words. Everyone say, thank God that's not me. I want to bring before you a scripture that God showed me a long time ago, told me that I needed to work on this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 through 3, and then finally verse 6. 1 through 3, and then verse 6. Walk prudently, that means uprightly, when you go to the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than give the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they... Do evil. What's a sacrifice of a fool? Fool is known by his many words. When you go in the house of God, you come in reverently. Even though this is just a building. You come in to learn, look, and you want to give your best, be your best. Why? Because you're in the house of the Lord where the king dwells. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. So if the king is there, then... Wear king attitude. Can you say amen? Have a king desire for him. Remember, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Holy Spirit's job is to reveal him to us if our heart is fixed on him. Isn't that sweet? Let me read on verse 2. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be. Remember, God says, be quick to hear, slow to, through James. Amen. There's a key to that. I have two ears and one mouth, yet we hear the mouth more than we can see the ears. Come on, smile at me. Verse, five, uh, verse 3 says, for a dream comes through a much activity. Folks, you'll see what I call everyday prophets. They run around, and because they're busy about things, they'll have a word. Now, I'm not putting people down like that, but listen, God's word is life-changing. If I gave you a word, if you do it, your life will change because it will be God giving you that word. But there are a lot of people that have dreams and visions because of their activity. And one day, I remember when I first had the spirit of prophecy come on me, but I had no knowledge of the word. You know what came out? It sounded like this. Yay, though you live in a pretty house and you have pretty flowers. If you don't put your eyes on me, say, God. You know, and I'm trying to give something of substance. But I got that because I saw a whole bunch of people just doing goofy stuff. And I was going to give them a word. You be careful of that kind of stuff. God is moving people away from that. Why? Because he wants each of us, listen carefully, to go after him in his word. 
not run after a word. Now listen, I'm not against getting a word. I'm not against going to do a, somebody else's meeting, somebody stands me up and gives me a word. That's wonderful. But I don't run around in my life trying to look for a word. Dear God, I have the Bible in my lap. You see how stupid we can become? Stupefied by watching the fads and the way things are done and not making any personal depth relationship with God. Say, not me. For a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by many words. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Nor say before the messenger, angel of God, messenger, there's angel, that it was an error. Didn't Jesus say something strange? Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Now go study that. God says, let you sincerely mean what you say so people have have some faith and sincerity in you. And if you say no, no means no. Not I'll get back with you. I'll call you, let's get to lunch and never hear from them again. Come on. This is why many Christians are powerless. It seems like, come on, like gangbusters, like somebody on a trail bike where they go, then it shuts off and they fall on their face. God talks about clouds with no water, the promise, 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 and yet they produce no fruit. It's in in Jude. Waves crashing on the rocks. Wow, looks wonderfully powerful, but then disappear. There's a lot of those spurting forth right now. And they're not, I'm not saying they're not of God. They're just not mature. There's a lot of people going to churches. Now listen, please don't take me wrong. Where the pastor isn't seasoned. He just come out of college, just come out, and they sent him up to do a job. He doesn't know the people. He has a visit with them. So he can't really minister because a shepherd lives with the sheep, been with the sheep, knows the sheep, knows how they smell, what they do. Hello. You never stick somebody out of Bible college in charge of a church. You do, you're just loony. They fall real quickly, not a novice, being puffed up with pride, it says, and then fall. And with the fall, take many with them. So, you know, I'm not a novice. And the solid word here, you say, well, pastor, I've heard that word. Yeah, but if you do what I've told you to do, the word will open up doors to you that you can't shut and the devil can't hassle. But see, it takes a, not a prideful man, but a humble man or woman to want to sit at the feet of Jesus, even if it's some silly man like me preaching. Hello? Hello? Go to a few other churches, maybe on Saturday night. I plan on visiting some. And the ones that I have visited, I was amazed how away from the word they are. They're into all kinds of crazy things. Now, I'm not want to put him down, but their lives are falling apart. They don't know how to believe. They don't know how to get healed. I know somebody, for years ago, I helped them in their marriage, and don't try to figure it out because they're long gone. But they love the Lord still. But their life is just a mess because they have not practiced the simple but always consistent things that we need to practice. Meeting with God first. Hard to do. Hard to do getting that habit. Oh, I do it, I do it, I do it. Well, it's not me getting you to do it. It's getting me to to really build that rock in you so that when all hell breaks down on you, you're not moved. That's my job, to encourage you to do that. Say amen. All right, so let's go to the next point. How we represent our king. Do we represent him as somebody bitter? Do we represent him as somebody sweet? Everybody's preaching some form of Christ. Did you know Paul talked about there are some that preach Christ out of bitterness, some preach out out of contempt, some preach out of gain. And he says some preach out of contention. Nevertheless, he says, Christ is being preached. Wrong ways to preach it, but he didn't attack them. Hello. We'll look at that scripture. Go with me to James. A little farther down to James 3. Look at verse 8. 
but no man can tame the tongue. Thank God you have the Holy Spirit in you and he can help you. So don't get discouraged. He's talking to Jews. They're trying to live for God naturally. No man can control their tongue naturally. We do it supernaturally. Can you say amen? It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Where's that poison come from? Your flesh. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men. How many know that that's a disconnect? Because none of your prayers will be answered. Listen, I hate, I hate to use me, but I might as well use me. Let's say I'm a pastor you don't know. And I say something, you decide you're going to rail on me to do that. Do you know, until you get that right with God, none of your prayers will be answered. You just shut everything down. Why? Because you're attacking one of God's children. Anathema, anathema. I don't care if you like Joel or not. I don't care if you like Kenneth Copeland or not. Don't you dare speak against God's people. Anathema, anath means you'll be a cursed thing. And nobody wants that. Everyone say, I'm a white sheep, not a black sheep of the family. Amen. In other words, you're not the off weirdo. Okay, say amen. All right, so James says, but no man can tame the tongue. Verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father. With it we also curse men who are made in the likeness of our God. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. Because you have two connections. That's why we crucify our flesh. Hello? You're tired before you go in and you bless your wife with crabbiness? Take a minute in prayer. Moving right along. Out of the same mouth we do this. Now verse 11, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water? Well, of course it doesn't. They're two different springs. The same opening can. You can mix fresh water with seawater out of the same opening. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? No. Can grapevines bear figs? No. Thus, no spring yields both bitter. In other words, you've got to make a decision. Every day, Jesus said, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Here's how I do it. So, Father, I come to you today, and I ask you to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I present my body a living sacrifice. I ask you to make all the adjustments you have inside of me and help my eyes and my understanding to see the way you want me to see and help me project forward the compassion of the Lord so when I come in contact with anyone, Jesus, they can see Jesus. I hope you wrote that down. Not you can catch the tape. I do that every morning. And you know what? It works. And you say, you're kidding. That's it. And you just go on a little further if you have the time to do that. You can do that in shower. You can do that walking to work or driving to work. The fact is, we don't do that, and Satan knows it. So he seems to make it harder the next time. I know when God first asked me to pray, every morning, come seek him. Seek him first. First time I did, second day. About a week went really good. Second week, I saw hardly any results and my flesh started arguing, and oh, I can do this, I should be doing this, and you can feel all that. That's a good sign. That's a good sign, because your flesh is getting nervous. And there's your problem. Satan needs your flesh in order to harass you. He, he can suggest all he wants, but if he can make you feel that way, it's even better. Don't be, don't be a boo-boo. Everyone say, don't be a boo-boo. Don't be a church boo-boo. That's going to be a new sitcom. Little honey boo-boo. Remember that one? Go. Amen. Uh, I heard a ooh on the audience in the camera already. Are you with me? All right. So point one, church, we are to let Jesus in us control us. To do that, you've got to ask him to teach you how to yield to him. And we also need for him to help us, our tongue to be controlled. Hold back what you want to say and say what Jesus wants you to say. It's going to take a little training for God to teach you that. I know Scott's got pretty much a lot of that. He, he's a soft man. He has quiet answers. He could really get upset and freak some people out. But he's got, the Lord seems to be working well with him. I love this, his mannerisms. It's awesome. Kudos. Ding, 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 ding. All right. Are you still with me? 
And point two, remember this. Point two, we have the same power to speak forth and through prayer to frame our worlds as Jesus did. Who lives in us? We've got to start focusing in on what and who we are in Christ. Thirdly, death and life are in the power of our tongue. We asked Jesus in, he came in, changed our death life to life life. And we did it with our words. Speak Christ, speak healing, encourage other people, stimulate other people's growth. Don't put people down, don't comment about other things. If I, I'm going to say this to you. If I tell you, God bless you, don't tell me he does. I got a little extra blessing for you. Oh, good, I'll keep it myself. You see, that's very selfish. And you know who started that? I remember 35, 40 years ago, I taught churches in the area. We strutted ourselves in men of faith. What a mess. People say, hey, are you blessed? God blesses me. You know, come on, what does that look like? You're adults, no shame. Take all the blessings you can get. Somebody wants to bless you, says, come on over here and lay hands on me. Start doing that. Start being receiving. Now, if I mentioned something that you've done and I corrected you on, that's, you feel well that I could use that illustration and didn't mention any names. Hello. The idea behind it is, if I can help you get blessed more, wouldn't you want that? I know you're blessed already. Hello? We want him to mount up. Start blessing others. Do not curse anyone else as a Christian. Don't criticize them. How many here remember Psalms what? Blessed are those that, what? Sit not in the seat of the council of the ungodly. Huh? In other words, don't sit back as a critic and criticize everything. Get in the game and win people to the Lord. Let's move on quickly. Here's my last scripture on that point. Ephesians chapter 4. You guys know this. 29 through 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessity edification. Doesn't do me any good to put you down. Build you up. Say amen. Treat people like they're royalty. Treat people good. And, and even if they don't feel good, they'll want to be good. You know, the other, we had an incident happen a while ago. You know what? I smiled and wasn't upset and everything, you know, and God took care of it. Sometimes we react to what we see right away, and that's what Satan's hoping us to do instead of praying about it and asking God to take over. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What is good and necessary for edification, building up, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and that you do not grieve the Holy Spirit. See, when you start talking negative and, and talking about this and down, and you might not even know you're doing anything wrong, you'll grieve the Holy Spirit. And who gives you your healing? The Holy Spirit. So to grieve means to push aside. Well, how do I know I did it? Oh, believe me, you'll know when you did it. Just quickly say, sorry, Lord, I, I, I apologize. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. Clamor is just babbling. Getting caught up in all this stuff is not important and evil speaking, be put away from you, put it away from you with all malice. Does anybody here know what malice is? Being malicious? I used to have people not do things just to irritate me. That's maliciousness. When, Pastor Craig, I want to know who's guilty. No. <laughs> no, I used to have one person crunch all the Kleenex boxes. On purpose. I watched them go through and that'll fix him. And then sit in the front row and flip me the bird. Isn't that great? I loved every minute of it. Because I preached, I looked right at them and preached them while they were doing it. And just talked to them. They just couldn't stand it. You know, the word will cut to the root anything that's unclean. 
Don't be afraid of their paces. Scott probably tell you, I know my wife can. I've had four attempts on my life. In the old church that I had, I've had people, two people come in with guns. They're going to shoot the pastor. We'll get that later. That's not important. Okay? And so they, my ushers had them down on the ground, handcuffed, and in the squad car, because they were both chief of police and most of their officers. Do you remember that? It was wonderful. I've had threats in my life. You, I have re- kept recordings where people have threatened me. I know who they are. You can tell what their, who the voices are. And I just want to know, how can a Christian person go from being on fire and lovey-dovey, I just love Jesus, turn to become some kind of monster? I'll tell you why. Because most of the stuff they're doing is phony, and it's doing from the surface. Hello? Because, remember, a natural man cannot walk in the spirit, can't sustain a quality of walk. You know, even though as good as I am, in the natural, I can't stay consistent long enough with things. Hello? Let's just be honest. But in the spirit, I can stay consistent. Say amen. And then we'll be finishing up with you. Last point. The work that I do, Jesus said, shall you do also. Say amen. Luke chapter 10, just want to show you now, this is Old Testament. Remember, Jesus hadn't died and rose again yet. So this is, he's imparting his anointing upon his disciples and causing them to have the same anointing as he did, casting out devils, doing that. So let's read it, verse 17. And when the 70 returned, they returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Two reasons why demons are subject. Number one, the earth was given to mankind. And number two, you guys are with Jesus, so he has to obey you in two accounts. Demons recognized. Now, remember the devil came to Jesus and says, Jesus of Nazareth, what have you to do with us? Have you come to torment us before our time? Because they know Jesus created them before they had become demons. Hello? And I could see Jesus thinking, you betcha. But he didn't say that. He just said, come out. Listen, Satan is, is scurried all around and about. So God puts a special anointing through Christ upon his disciples. And look, they come back and say, wow, the devil's subject to us. Folks, we're in the New Testament. The devil is even more subject to you now. He's just convinced a lot of Christians not to proceed forward or do th- certain things through fear and and ineffectiveness, we'll say. Hello, are you with me? And he said to them, verse 18, I saw Satan fall from lightning from heaven. That was very before the creation of Adam and Eve. Satan was thrown out of heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the authority of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Nevertheless... Don't focus on this. Don't focus you can make devils run. Don't focus you can lay hands on the sick. Focus on this. Rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. Now, I love to tell people this. When were your names written down in heaven? Before the foundation of the earth. Not when you got born again. God didn't write your name down. Most Christians believe that. No. Before the earth was created, he purposed for us to be here, to be his companions and his friends. And something happened. Hello? So your name was written. Then when you got born, when Carrie came forth at his time, I lived before God in love, according to Ephesians 1, verse 5, until I got old enough for the devil to drive me to do things wrong. Then I separated from God. Now I must become born again. We know this, right? I want you to really understand you're going to be dealing with people that don't know this and you've got to share this stuff with them. Hello? Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Because you're there, God's You have God's authority. 
Write this down, John 1, 12. As many as received Jesus, he gave authority to be the sons of God. Now, take, uh, let me take you to John 14. Let's look at this one. Jesus is speaking here. Verse 12. This is wonderful. When Jesus said, most assuredly, what do you think that means? Get this. Get it. Get it. Get it. This is the latest, guys. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Why? Because God is at work in us doing his work already. We just let him out, let him continue his work. Can you say amen? This way it's legal. God includes us. We're vessels of honor, carrying him around, releasing the kingdom of God. He said in the last days, he'd pour out his spirit. He pours it out of you and I because we're vessels. We're jars. So what's coming out of you? Kingdom, power, glory, are you complaining? If you don't like what you see, change it, ambassador. Come on, you can. You might have to bash it a whole bunch of times first because you let that thing become a monster, but move right on. The works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works than these shall you do. Why? Because God can now work with the Holy Spirit, work in you, and you can be creative and literally you can get around. We have transportation, radio, we have CD, we have all kinds of stuff, internet. But greater is he that's in you. And that's the reason you can do the things that you can. Now, you'll only be able to do it in the spirit, and you'll have to kick back your flesh so it doesn't want to take the glory. And whatever you ask, and he goes on, he says, and greater works than these than you do it. And whatever you ask the Father, is amazing he put that in there, in my name and I will do it. Where is he? He's in you. So you release Jesus. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. Really. We don't release Jesus. We try to impress people with our intellect and what we know. And whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. And the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do. Interesting, he uses a different phrase. He says, release me like a smart bomb. I will answer the prayer. I will go right in there and straighten things out. You got somebody who's harassing you? Say, Lord, instead of me getting all upset, I release you into their life and you straighten them out in Jesus' name. How easy was that? I love it when God gives us some of his wisdom. Finally, Mark 16, verse 15, you know this. And he said to them, go. Folks, you get stale when you think about why, how come. When you sit around, watch a sit comes on the TV and you're not praying like you should. And then when you ask for something because you really need it, nothing seems to manifest. How come? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Are you sick? Go lay hands on somebody else and get them healed. Go pray for somebody. Call them up on the phone and share healing with them. How about that? Oh, I can't share healing. I'm sick. There you go, focusing on yourself again. Of course you are sick. How do you think you're going to get healed? Focusing on yourself? Let's move on past that. And he who believes and is baptized, that means born again, that's baptized into Christ, will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. You have to have Jesus in your heart. 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Say, that's me. You should be looking for God to do these things through you. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongue. That charges you up. They will take up serpents. That means you'll handle all the little spooks and all the weird whacked out people that's all around you. God will give you the wisdom. He'll say, hey, there's going to be a man that comes to you, and he's going to want to con you. He'll tell you about it before he comes. Start getting in tune with God. 
you'll be able to handle the serpent, say amen. And if you drink or partake of anything that could harm you, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they shall be, they shall recover. Now, listen, do you heal the people? Here's what you do. Everyone, put your hand out. Put your hand out. Now, close your eyes and imagine Christ flowing right through your hand. Say, in Jesus' name. And you'll sense a power flowing right through your hand. That's the healing power. Release it on people. When you're praying, don't pray off your head, trying to dazzle. Pray out of your spirit and formulate your words slowly. And Lord, I put them before, and I can artist, choose your words properly. Don't just throw things out. You'll stumble over many words. And choose your words. Now, I'm overemphasizing the slowness. But calculate and be purposeful. Remember, you're sowing the seed, even in prayer. Someone say, amen. amen. And if they drink any, they, they will not, and they lay hands on the sick. Now, verse 19 tells us, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven. That was his rapture, by the way, if you don't believe in a rapture. And sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached where? Everybody you meet, share a seed. And the Lord working with them, see, now he's in them. Confirming or bearing witness the word through signs and wonders. You see, I don't try to get you healed. I'm not trying to convince you to be a wonderful Christian. I'm going to present you with the word. The anointed one is going to teach you about all that. But all stems on our willingness to be with God and take him seriously. You know that. Your whole lives depend on whether you do that or not. So, number one, don't be easily distracted. Number two, get a guard on your mouth. Number three, don't hold any odd or bitterness against anyone. Number four, don't criticize another child of God, whether you think they deserve it or not. I have a lot of people talk about me. I don't even know what they're talking. It's a funny thing. I just laugh because if they're striking me, they have to get through God's office. And they get through God's office, they struck him in the face. And now they're in big trouble. So I don't have to defend myself. Listen, God will defend you. God will defend you. You don't have to defend yourself. So the next time somebody calls you something or you're up to, don't try to defend yourself, smile at them, say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Did you get anything out of that this morning? Would you give the Lord praise?